in many rural areas of the American West, cutting firewood in national forests is a necessary chore if you want a warm house through the winter. Our home in mountainous central Idaho was no exception. It was normal for my dad to pick my brothers and I up after school and head up into the mountains for an afternoon of firewood gathering. My dad would fell the dead trees, then saw them into chunks. My brothers and I had the task of rolling the wood to the truck and loading it. We would continue this assembly line process until we had a truckload of wood, usually before nightfall. Hot, sweaty, and exhausted, we would pile into the truck cab and make our way down the mountain. At home the next day, we would unload and split the wood and stack it into neat little rows. This process was repeated until we had a winter's worth of fuel for our house, our grandma's cabin, and any extra for elderly neighbors. This particular afternoon, we decided to try a different logging road on the other side of the valley. This was well outside our family logging area. No real reason for the change, but my dad said he wanted a change of scenery. This logging road hadn't been maintenanced in some time. Large rocks and fallen branches littered the path. My brothers and I had to walk out in front, pushing rocks and wood out of the way as my dad lurched the truck up the switchbacks. Yard by yard, we slowly made our way up the mountain. The hike was physically brutal. As we ascended the mountain and got farther into the trees, this odd feeling started to set in. I wasn't sure if it was the exhaustion from the hike or something more. There was electricity in the air, like the whole mountain was buzzing at a wavelength just below my senses. In some odd way, it felt like the mountain knew we were there, and it wasn't welcome to that fact. I wanted to say something to my brothers, but before I opened my mouth, my younger brother said, Does anyone else feel like we're not welcome here? My older brother and I stopped in our tracks and looked back at him. Both of us nodded in agreement. This moment was broken by my dad honking and motioning us to continue clearing the path. Reluctantly, we pushed forward to a small clearing in the woods where we finally stopped the truck. My dad, oblivious to our apprehension, or simply choosing to ignore it, grabbed his saw and went to work. As the wood was felled and loaded, I couldn't shake this feeling enveloping me like a dark shroud. I noticed my brothers were taking occasional glances over their shoulders as we worked. Everyone but my dad, it seemed, was on edge. The sun nestled down into the trees, and twilight began to set in. As the light drained from the sky, my anxiety only intensified. It wasn't until my dad unexpectedly told us to load up that a wave of relief flooded over me. I could see the tension in my brothers melt away as well. The truck wasn't fully loaded, an oddity. Getting a half load was a waste, according to my dad. We would sometimes work into the dark just to make sure the truck was full. But tonight, he seemed eager to head home. With everything loaded, we started down the road. Although dead tired, everyone seemed to be in a much lighter mood. We were chatting and cracking jokes while trying to blow off steam from the afternoon. We were almost out of the tree line and into the valley desert. Going down the switchbacks, you want to be careful, especially with a load. Even if it was half that, a brown blur jumped up from the downslope of the switchback. Shit was the only word that came out of my dad's mouth as he slammed on the brakes. Loaded with wood and traveling downhill, there was no way to avoid smashing into the blur. The truck finally ground to a standstill. The four of us peered through the windshield, nobody saying a word. Illuminated in the yellow glow of the headlights was a crumpled body of a deer. Grumbling and cursing the deer's existence, my dad exited the truck to investigate. Doing as they were told, my brother stayed put in the truck. I didn't listen following close behind my dad. The truck was fine. We hadn't been traveling fast when we smacked the deer. Just some hair and blood in the grill guard. Hitting a deer really wasn't that unusual. The mountains were full of them. What was unusual was that the deer dropped so quickly. 
At faster speeds, deer could still be upright and sprinting away to die in the woods after a collision. That last burst of adrenaline dump. This one fell over like a rag doll. Before even approaching the carcass, a deep, foul smell hit us. Deer smell bad when they're alive, but this was on a whole other level. It was the smell of decay and rot. My stomach began to turn as we got closer. My nostrils were burning. Coming up on the deer, it was clearly dead. Really, really dead. The stench was so overwhelming, my eyes were watering. The body was a true horror scene. The deer's eyes were gone, replaced with a sunken, hollow hole, as if to overcompensate for their absence. The tongue was swollen and black as coal. It could not be contained and hung out the side of its mouth. The underbelly was split open, entrails and offal spilled into the dirt. In the dim headlights, it looked as though as the deer's fur and viscera were moving, wiggling almost. Holding my breath, I bent down for a closer look, and my heart stopped. The deer, inside and out, was covered in maggots. It was dead all right, but our truck didn't kill it. Clearly, it had been dead for days, if not weeks. I backed away, retching. That electric anxiety came screaming back. My dad was always the quiet, stoic type, but right now, even in the dim headlights of the truck, I could see the abject horror in his face. His gaze wasn't on the deer, but focused down the mountain. Poorly masking the fear in his voice, he told me firmly to walk back to the truck and get inside. I obeyed without objection. As I grabbed the door handle, a loud shriek came out of the trees. Branches were shattering and breaking. Something was heading up the slope towards us. I slammed my door just as my dad reached the truck. Before his door was shut, he pressed on the accelerator. The truck launched forward sending us over the deer carcass and racing downhill. With mine and my brothers yelling, it was hard to tell if the shrieking was following us. Our truck popped out of the tree line and into the desert sagebrush. Once out of the woods, everything quietened down. We were left with only the rumble of the engine and wind through the half-open windows. Pulling into our property, the truck came to a stop. We sat in silence. No one moved to leave the truck. Everyone started talking at once. We all had questions. What was that screaming? How does a dead deer jump uphill in front of a truck? There was no way the truck killed it. My dad just shook his head and motioned for us to quiet down. That deer was dead when we hit it. It didn't jump out in front of us. It was thrown at us. We stared at him. He explained that all day up on the mountain, he had felt uneasy. Not wanting to worry us boys, he kept it to himself. He described it like walking into a stranger's living room while they were upstairs asleep. That feeling never left him, and as twilight came, he happened to catch a shadow in the corner of his eye, not far into the woods, and saw figures moving from tree to tree. He couldn't focus on them long enough for a good look before they dodged behind the trees. His stomach dropped. Working hard to keep his composure, he hurried us to the truck to leave. It was after hitting the deer and discovering it was long dead that my dad pieced together what was happening. Something threw that deer to get us to stop. Before the shrieking began, he could hear something moving in the darkness beyond the road. It was a trap. Running back to the truck could have started an ambush or trigger a prey drive, so we walked back to the truck. The second we were inside, he drove that truck downhill with no intention of stopping for anyone or anything. That feeling of electricity didn't disappear until we hit the county highway. My brothers and I never saw anything as we drove away, but those screams from the forest will never leave my mind. We didn't gather firewood the rest of the season. For the first time in his life, my dad just bought what we needed. And although we started to gather wood again the next season, 
We've never been back up to that particular mountain. The Forest Service has permanently closed and reclaimed that road. The only way back up into those woods is a long hike, one I'm not interested in ever taking. Whatever was on that mountain, whatever threw that deer carcass, whatever chased us out of the woods, it did not want us there. It wanted us gone. Or worse, it wanted us dead. I have a story to share that has really traumatized me for quite a while now, and I feel this is a good place to share. For context, it's important that I state that I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We do have the odd missing person or scary case, but it's otherwise safe here, and not much happens. I mean that in a way that as a 19-year-old girl, I feel comfortable to walk the streets at night or go on hikes alone because it's pretty safe and everyone looks out for one another generally. This happened in the summer of 2019. My boyfriend and I were headed out on a picnic date spot we'd visited before plenty of times, Karakariki Trek. It's at the end of a very long windy rural farm road off the state highway, so you drive like 15 to 20 minutes from the main road down a long farm stretch, and at the end is a large cul-de-sac and a surrounding massive farm. The owners of the farm had left the land kind of open to the public as a reserve because there are native trees and other things, and because about a 15 minute walk from the cul-de-sac slash car park, there's a small waterfall you can swim in. The track is really popular as it's one of the closest swimming spots to the nearest city, and it's really scenic. You cross footbridges and pass by creek beds and that kind of thing. The farmers still go through every now and then and do their farm work, and there are fenced off areas that the public can't enter as they still actively work the land. This particular day, my boyfriend and I were happy because it was empty in the parking lot and it was a really hot summer day, so that was really rare. The farmer was crossing the cows through the gate on a quad as we arrived, and he smiled and waved at us. He's an older man and we'd spoken before as we were regular visitors, so we set off towards the waterfall. We crossed one footbridge and passed through a big paddock of cows. The track is quite narrow and the creek is right off the edges, so you have to be careful. We saw the waterfall, decided against swimming as we had no towels, and headed back towards the car park. Now on our way back, we decided to go down a little bit of a steep gravel off-ramp on the track that led to a more private tree-covered area right by the creek. Here's where it starts. We were kissing and whatnot. I was laying on my stomach reading a book, and my boyfriend was sitting up playing on his phone, and he was rubbing my back and playing with my hair. We were there for about ten minutes before I turned and glanced up the gravel path, and way up even further on a hill through one of the farmer's gates, I saw a big man on a quad bike who I didn't recognize as one of the farmers, as there's only an old couple who work the land. He was just sitting there, staring at my boyfriend and I, and I don't even want to think about how long he'd been there before we noticed. I told my boyfriend, and as soon as the guy saw that we were both looking at him, he opened the gate and started heading down. Now both of us immediately got up to leave, as we did not want to have a conversation with the farmer about us getting freaky on his land, which is what we both assumed would happen, but it was so much worse. This guy came down the gravel track and ran his quad right through the creek. He left it there running in the water and got off. He was talking to himself, saying things along the lines of, Ah oh, fuck, I've messed up my quad, I've fucked my engine over and over before he even got near us. My boyfriend and I were gathering our things to leave at this point, and he starts to head toward us. He didn't even make small talk, which was really strange, because he went straight into saying, Have you guys seen any fish? I'm looking for some fish to kill. My boyfriend tells the guy there's no fish in the creek as it's fresh water, and he's probably best off to catch some eel and this sends him into a fit, and he starts saying, I don't want no fucking eel, 
I want to kill some fish. I'd made it a point to not look the guy in the eyes as I didn't want to draw the conversation towards myself because I was already extremely freaked out and I didn't want him to notice that. My boyfriend is much more of the calm and strong one when it comes to stuff like this, but for a second I did look at the guy and I thought he looked like his face was slightly deformed, possibly Bell's palsy as I work in aged care and I've seen it a bit and it looked similar. I bent down to tie my shoe up, and when I was standing back up, that's when I saw a pistol on the man's waist. Listen to me close now. This is the first and last time in my entire life I've ever seen a real-life gun. It's incredibly hard to get a firearm in New Zealand, especially after the regulations following the mass shooting in Christchurch. And not only that, he had one pistol on his belt and was waving another one about in his hand while he talked to my boyfriend about wanting to kill some fish. He was aiming it down to the creek every now and again, and then swinging it around his finger. My boyfriend gave me this stern look, and stern is the best word for it, because the look spoke a million things to me in that moment, and he nodded his head towards the gravel hill leading back to the track. I grabbed the two bags we had, Fake checked my phone and told the man that our family were waiting for us back at the car park. He completely ignored what I had said and instead said, That's a cool hat you got on. Or something about my hat that was completely irrelevant. So I dismissed myself and said goodbye and made my way to the hill. In my mind, I did not want to look back and see my boyfriend be shot and then a gun at my head. I knew our best bet was getting up this hill onto the narrow path he couldn't ride his quad down and sprinting to the farmer's house. As I'm walking up the hill, this guy says to my boyfriend, that's a real pretty girl you got there. And it was like all the intentions of his I didn't want to believe were confirmed. I felt like I would die. My boyfriend though said a quick thank you, we'll be off now, and headed up the hill with me. The guy kept talking on like the conversation hadn't ended even as we headed away and he stood there, gun in hand, watching us leave. As soon as we were around the corner, we sprinted all the way back to the car park where there were ten empty bullet cases. We had run into two girls in bikinis just arriving at the spot as we did and we informed them about everything. They got into their cars and left immediately. We tried to go to the farmer's house to ask if he knew the guy as we'd never seen him on the land before, but they were not home anymore. As for the gun, it's still so freaky to me as I'd never seen one before. But these pistols look quite old and rusty, and when we discussed the incident on the way home, my boyfriend suggested they were probably handed down to him from someone else. This incident had stuck with me for the past few years and my boyfriend and I have not been able to return to the spot, which sucks because that's where we had our first date and it was a really sentimental place for us. I had to drive past the road leading to the track for like a year as I commuted between towns and it always made me feel sick. I could have lost my life or my partner that day or so much worse and I'm always extremely grateful that my boyfriend is the man he is and was able to steer the guy away from us for us to leave and to communicate to me through movement to tell me what to do in my freaked out state. He told me after that he was ready to die if he had to because knowing the guy had been watching us beforehand and complimenting me in the way he did, it was clear that he could have had some scary intentions. It's also made me way more fearful now to travel in the bush alone, which I've done my whole life. Rural Northeast Ohio, an hour and a half southeast of Cleveland. Back in 2020, my wife and I really got into fishing after a small, off-the-grid type vacation. We decided to keep the good vibes going when we returned home by making plans to fish the following week. We decided to head out near where my parents live because there was a large lake that everyone fished at, but I also knew of a small lake just up the way that only a few people knew of. When we arrived at the large well-known spot, it was packed. We tried to find a place to cast in, 
but after searching for about 20 minutes, I packed up and we just went to the hidden gem up the road. When we arrived, no one was there, and we gave each other a high five and started finding a place to set up. My wife went about a quarter mile away from me and we began casting in. The pond is surrounded by about three miles of wood on each side and was nice and peaceful, or so I thought. About 15 minutes into it, my wife waves me over with a scared look on her face. Thinking she's probably hooked something she couldn't pull in, I started jogging down to her. When I arrived, she looked me in the eyes and said, There's a baby crying in the woods and someone's yelling at it. I started to laugh and explain we were the only ones here, but she insisted. We packed up our things as we both felt a bit uncomfortable and we were just going to call it a day and get out of there but some weird curiosity took over both of us, and after loading up the car, we both walked into the woods to see if we could find anything. About 20 feet in, we saw a baby shoe, and a few more feet, children's clothes. Then a whole camp set up with wet children's clothes everywhere, soaking wet. Toys, socks, shoes, then piles of human waste and adult male clothing. We looked at each other and turned to leave when we heard some crazy movement coming from behind us. We turned around and saw something running through the woods to the right of us. We both just took off running as fast as we could. We jumped back into the car and I drove straight to my parents' house. They only live four miles from this spot at most. I ran into the house and explained everything to my dad what happened, and he told me I could call the state trooper, who was the only sort of authority in the area. So I did. They just told me they would check it out. Nothing ever came of it. I have no idea if they believed me or not. I never really thought about this again until this past weekend. I visited my parents again for some holiday cookout. My grandparents now live on the same property after some health complications. Right when I was leaving at about 10pm, my grandpa looked me right in the eye and said, Drive safe. There are people in the woods. I asked him what he meant. But he does have dementia coming on, so I was worried this was a flare-up. He then went on to say a few more sentences about people traveling with children through the woods. I can't stop thinking about it. When I was a kid... I used to spend my summers in my grandparents' summer home, which was located precisely in the middle of Mountainville, nowhere. Like, there's not even gravel road access to the house. You gotta trek through some pretty dense bush on a pretty steep incline in order to get there. Because I was a kid, one who had no inkling of what internet was, I loved everything about it. Endless exploration, rock climbing, and other danger-seeking opportunities. I convinced my grandfather to build me and my cousin a treehouse, eating the best food known to man, swapping scary stories by a campfire. Everything was awesome. Everything. Except that one time I came across a random well in the middle of the woods. Now, wells in and of themselves can be pretty creepy, but I think this one takes the cake. It looked like something that belonged in a medieval fantasy horror story. It had this really tall, pointy thatched roof, a base of grey, mossy, misaligned stones, and even had a wooden bucket, which didn't strike me as weird at the time, but looking back, the bucket was spiffy clean. It was made of this nice, glossy wood that wasn't chipped or marred in any way. Really, it looked brand new, so that was weird. I remember stumbling upon this well, and instead of being absolutely thrilled to explore it, like my reckless, curious child self would have been, I felt sick, like physically nauseous. I couldn't stand to look at the thing without feeling gross. I had zero desire to go near it. I did go near it because curiosity won out in the end, and I wanted to have a story to tell my cousin, so I went up to it and looked down. Man, I kid you not, this thing had stairs in it shiny, wooden spiral stairs leading down to who knows where. For some reason, 
they scared the piss out of me and I hightailed it out of there real quick. I never told my cousin because I know he would have wanted to go and find it and climb down and the idea of doing that honestly made me feel like crawling out of my skin. It still does, just thinking about it. Anyway, the real scary part about it is that this random ass well started popping up and still does pop up in my dreams from time to time. Like, it just appears in the middle of whatever dream I'm having. To this day, and I'm an adult now, it still scares the life out of me. To be honest, I don't believe in the supernatural, but I don't think I'll ever be able to overcome this instinctual fear to go down this well, in dream or otherwise. I was driving through eastern Washington on some state roads. There were no rest stops or cities, but I'd done the route enough to know that there were these massive dirt areas every 40 miles where you could park safely away from the road. I decided to call it a night and closed my blinds and laid down to watch something on my phone. After roughly an hour, I hear someone try to open the driver's side door. I haven't heard any vehicles on the road the whole time I parked but I get up to have a peek out of the curtains. As I'm looking out into the blackness of the driver's side window, I hear them try the passenger side door. I peek down from the top of the curtain but can't see anything, so I start the truck and kick on the lights. I'm fairly freaked out at this point, so I'm still not opening the curtains but peeking through the gaps. Nothing, nobody is standing near either of my doors or parked within sight lines. I take a deep breath and close the sleeper curtains too, because for some reason, that's gonna make things better, right? After laying back down and convincing myself that something blew against the truck, and it only sounded like the doors, I hear what sounds like someone trying to pry open the vents on the sleeper. The door handles start clicking again, and the truck starts shifting like someone's climbing on it. I hit the little alarm button in the sleeper, hoping to spook them off but it does nothing but add to the noise of the door handles, fingers tapping and the hiss of air coming out of the suspension. And suddenly it stops. A few moments where I can only hear myself breathing and my heart pounding before I hear another truck approach and then drive by. I spent the next few hours waiting for whatever it was to come back, but it never did. In the morning, I couldn't find any footprints or damage to my truck, but on every window were tiny, human-looking handprints, like a toddler had licked their hand and stuck it to my window over and over. My father and I were taking a quick hike just a few miles north of Butte, Montana. It's not absolute wilderness that far outside of Butte, but just a few miles outside. Most towns in Montana means you're way out in the backwoods. It wasn't an unusual day by any means, a warm June afternoon, perfect for a little hike. We were only a mile or so from where we parked when we saw a large trash bag along the trail. I hate litter bugs, especially out in the woods. I intended to haul it back with us and dispose of it properly. When I attempted to lift the bag though, it was heavy, much heavier than I'd anticipated. Curiosity got the better of me and my father, and we split the bag open to see what was inside. I was expecting a dead animal of some sort. It's not totally unusual for someone to dispose of a dead dog or cat in this fashion in this part of the world. Some people out here will poach deer and leave the trimmings like this too. Upon opening the bag, we saw a boot, and then socks, and then pants. We then realized they were attached to human legs. It looked so unreal, like a movie prop, like someone took a saw and cut off a store dummy's legs at the groin. This had to be some sort of a prank, right? It wasn't. I fell backwards and started having a panic attack. Nothing prepares you for something like that. My dad, on the other hand, sprung into action. 
He immediately closed the bag back up as best as he could and then started to slowly survey our surroundings. That freaked me out even more. Through my gasps, I asked him what he was looking for. All he said was, there might be someone watching us. Can you imagine stumbling upon a serial killer's dump site and they're at a distance watching you? That really didn't help my panic. As I tried to calm down, my dad called the Silver Bow County Sheriff and reported what we'd found. Limp-legged, we hiked the mile or so to the road and waited for the cops to show up. The authorities searched the area with cadaver dogs for a week and never found any other pieces of the body or even a scent trail to follow. The sheriff's people even searched our truck and interviewed us to see if we might be responsible. Nothing ever came of the whole incident, not one single thing. It's been just over 10 years and nobody has any idea who the Lex belonged to or how they got there. No missing persons report that matched up, and DNA from the Lex never showed up on any databases. Butte, Montana has a reputation for being a bit of a rough side, so it's not impossible the guy was a local who ran into trouble. But why wouldn't his family or friends report him missing? Surely someone would have noticed he was gone, or at the very least, legless. I don't think we'll ever know the truth, but someone out there knows what happened and they aren't too eager to give us the whole story. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share. You can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Madison C, Wasps Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna. Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, Tripping Balls Through History, Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracard, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Kel, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well guys. I'll see you all on the next one.